Okay, we can have a quick talk about uh, the localization process. Some parts are specific to open office, other are generic. And uh, how it works. A couple words about me. Uh, I'm active in several open source projects as a volunteer in my spare time. My job is completely unrelated to uh, open office uh, and uh, any other uh, open source uh, activities. I served as a project chair and release manager of open office in the past years and I'm now just an ordinary project member focusing on uh, the Italian dictionary and on the localization process uh, in general. Why is it a key field? Because, of course, a lot of new people join the project uh, by starting uh, with, uh, with localization. And, uh, it is a typical request that we receive that uh, a volunteer would be able, in some undefined way, to help the project uh, by contributing to localization and not, uh, not starting with development uh, or, uh, or something else. Not starting with documentation because apparently that's uh, uh, still uh, problematic in some, uh, in some respects, but uh, usually they want just to, to see OpenOffice translated into their language. There are a lot of uh, political factors uh, behind this and other, uh, other reasoning that uh, can be really motivating for, for a new volunteer. And uh, actually, adding a language to open office uh, doesn't mean, in, mean anything in itself, since uh, adding a language means uh, a lot of different uh, things. There are document languages, there are interface languages, and uh, in the open office case, there are the active Poodle languages. Each of them is different. The document languages, of course, is the most official part. Uh, if I want to have open office support uh, a new language, then uh, we refer to um, international codes uh, and uh, standards, uh, not real standards. I mean, for, uh, for Microsoft uh, Office compatibility, we have at times to, to just consider that the Microsoft uh, mm, mapping of languages as an internal standard for better interoperability, and the same for uh, adding new languages uh, that can work uh, the same way between, say, OpenOffice and LibreOffice. So this, is, this entails a bit of paperwork. It's rare that uh, a volunteer is well prepared about this, but uh, this is the first basic step with uh, a few source code file changes. And at the end, uh, OpenOffice knows that a language exists. So this list is used, for example, if you go to uh, format character font, uh, and you have uh, a list of all uh, available languages for, uh, for your installation and uh, for the spell check, meaning uh, theoretically supporting a spell checker for that language. Otherwise, it will not work at all. You, you need to, to bind the spell checker to a language, and this is the basic step. Unless your uh, uh, office suite supports the language, you will not be able to use it, or uh, you will uh, have to, to do horrible hacks that, uh, fortunately, we don't have the time to cover here. Then there are the interface languages. Interface languages means, of course, having OpenOffice translated into your language. And uh, in some very rare cases, mostly of them, uh, say, politically motivated, people want to translate OpenOffice into a language even if it is not officially recognized uh, as a language or even if uh, uh, our support of standards is insufficient to that aim. In this case, we do have a couple of uh, languages that are only interface languages, meaning that they cannot write a document in the same language or they cannot have a proper spell checker in the same language and they have to abuse another spell checker. That's uh, the idea. Basically, you create an Italian dictionary, but you put uh, Catalan words into it, and uh, you say it's, uh, it's a Catalan dictionary. It works like a Catalan dictionary, but uh, if you then open your document uh, on another installation, it will 
be uh, interpreted as a document written in Italian. So things get very complex. Otherwise, this is just a normal second step. I mean, we, we know the language, we support it in the interface. Then there is this third step for OpenOffice, since uh, out of about 120 interface languages that do have a partial translation and that are in the, our source code, we release uh, about 41. About uh, meaning that there is one special language that is called the key ID language that is uh, just uh, uh, a, a fake artificial languages, uh, language used uh, to give a unique identifier to every string. So you, you get uh, English plus a number so that uh, your open in file open can be distinguished by the word open appearing somewhere else in the interface. The first one gets annotated as say open one, two, three and the other one will be open two, three, four. Portal, our uh, web translation service, uh, supports this uh, 41 and a few more. And uh, the other partial translations are in the source code, but uh, were never imported into Putil and have been not imported, imported yet. So when we, we have a new volunteer for language X, say, if X is in Putil, everything is very easy. And, uh, within 24 hours the guy will be able to, to actually start working. Otherwise we have to create the language in Putol and uh, this will be handled separately since uh, mm, we, we need to have a very quick overview of tools. There are too many and probably too bad for, uh, for the purpose but uh, this is the current situation. So Putol is the user facing uh, interface just uh, to us just uh, a way to collaborate on uh, online editing of PO files. We don't use any exotic features, just, uh, this is just the basic uh, purpose of Putol. We do use uh, some command line tools on the Putol server that uh, help with management. Some teams uh, actually prefer to work uh, offline. They just download their PO files they could uh, do without Putol completely. Mm, th this is fine so long as everyone in the team is uh, willing to do that. Okay, in the case of uh, the Apache, Apache Software Foundation, we have uh, one Putol installation for all projects. Uh, OpenOffice is only one of uh, hundreds of projects at uh, Apache. Committers can log in directly from uh, any project. Other volunteers need an account created, but this is the only overhead we have. So the Putol part is the nice part that uh, users and volunteers see. But behind that, uh, there is this obscure SDF format, uh, which is uh, a simple, very simple actually. It is just a set of fields separated by tab, which is fine uh, as long as you have three uh, columns of data, but when you have dozens of columns of data, it's just uh, impractical. And uh, it is by the build system. It is specific to OpenOffice uh, and, uh, okay, to the historic tradition of the OpenOffice code, to be precise. And uh, uh, <coughs> one uh, interface translation is one SDF file. So basically, Italian, the Italian translation is one file that uh, can be found offline if you'd like to crash your browser uh, here. And uh, it is uh, two megabytes and about uh, uh, 73,000 lines uh, or strings. It is uh, highly impractical uh, for, uh, for the editing er and for uh, anything else. Even though it is theoretically possible to go there, edit one string, save and rebuild OpenOffice and it will work. But uh, as we will see, it will not last long since uh, it will get uh, overwritten. Let's uh, just see the history of uh, a string as a practical example. Uh, the full process to get a string translated. Uh, of course, uh, you need uh, to mark content as translatable. And uh, I will uh, skip some details, but basically you have resource files uh, and uh, you should use the resource files here to define a string. So the string, this is the menu string saying convert text to table. And uh, 
one first major issue, this is the English string. So English is written by programmers who are often not native speakers. Uh, we had uh, native English speakers uh, come to us in the past years and say that some expression were like uh, the language of a lawyer from the 18th century, but uh, it was just uh, what uh, the non -nat not native uh, programmer uh, had written in code. Second step, you extract these uh, localizable strings and basically you make a fake translation that is the, the English reference, a template to be exact. So one huge SDF file, which is uh, for, uh, for the English language, and it is extracted directly from resource files. The third step from the huge files, you generate the PO files uh, that are the, say, industry standard for translation or one of the most uh, common formats for translation. And then uh, you upload them to Putol. Then you actually start translating and do the translation. This is the only part that uh, a volunteer is looking at normally. And then again, you go back and you go all the way back. So from the PO files, you go back to the SDF files and then you rebuild OpenOffice and at that point, uh, it will pick up the new translations. We have, okay. Two, three minutes, uh, still two, three minutes for uh, describing possible improvements. Well, it's, it's clear uh, so far. Uh, uh, first, uh, it is a process that can break in too many points. Uh, second, uh, uh, we do have current issues at the moment. For example, the last Putol update uh, was done a long time ago. So we are unsure of uh, what uh, translators are actually translating at the moment. They will be mostly good, but there is uh, a delta with respect to, to trunk that has different resource files that would need uh, a full update. Uh, there is some tool to check uh, validity, but uh, you can get a broken build uh, if uh, you have an invalid uh, SDF file. And, uh, Fixing it is uh, slow and painful, and the Putol can do something. We have tool, tools to check, uh, to do some basic checks, but uh, they are not really reliable. And one other issue is that creating a new language from uh, the current trunk uh, can be done, but we would need to synchronize all languages first. How can we get uh, out of this? Well. Possibly for the future, once it is fixed with the current way of uh, working, possibly one step, uh, one major step in the future is uh, to just get rid of some intermediate formats. And other pro projects have already done it, uh, and uh, the intermediate format is very error prone. It could uh, just be, be skipped, and uh, we could settle on one standard uh, format, and just use it and try to support it as much as possible. There are many other improvements like, uh, say, creating an internal language that is the, the programmer's English, as they call it, uh, and get a real uh, English translation uh, out of it so that uh, changing uh, a typo in English does not uh, require updating uh, of uh, a, all other uh, languages. And then, of course, uh, one thing that uh, we will need to work on is more automation. There is a project started by Ian Iversen years ago and now uh, never integrated and uh, not in active development at the moment. It was called uh, Gen Lang, and uh, it had many workflow advantages in its design. And uh, the interesting approach is that uh, many of the steps that I've described as manual so far can be automated, or at least it makes sense to try to automate them as much as possible, especially because our tools uh, are, not, uh, are not very robust. To, to give you a stupid example, uh, in, okay, w when you create the, the first, uh, okay, the first extraction here, 
if you don't give it uh, a full path, the tool will break silently. There's no, no reason for it uh, at, at all, of course. It's just, uh, just a buggy system that has to be checked uh, and polished uh, a bit. Uh, so the more we can uh, automate and refine the tools, uh, the best uh, for, uh, for the future. OK, just in time, thank you. And uh, I'll let uh, Peter go on, but I will be available for any other questions or while we switch a presenter, if Peter. <laughs>